So in a sense, you could say there's two main components to success. You could say to anything, but success when it comes to what we're doing here, exploration of self, exploration of the soul, what we are, what we're capable of, alignment. That whole game, if you have the component of understanding as one, like understandings, concepts, so through these talks, for example, you gain insights, you gain understandings. And through those understandings, you grow, you learn, you recontextualize things over and over and over again. Um, you deepen your understanding, your sense of identity shifts over time from falser concepts to truer concepts to ultimately no concepts. But there's another component that's important throughout all that, which is your ability to focus or the quality of your attention itself. It's like uh, the contents and the quality of the paper or the ink. So if you have really bad quality paper, it's, um, it's hard for those concepts, for those contents to be written down really clearly, to have a really clear image and understanding because you can't really hold any of it. You can't really attain any of it without the quality also of attention or focus, you could say. So just for a few minutes, kind of like a meditation, I just want you to notice your distractions, just your thoughts. And just by noticing it, you will also notice how there's something that's undistracted. There's an awareness that's already here, hearing my voice. And it's like the sky that pervades the clouds. It's like the gaze that pierces through everything that comes and goes and appears. I often use the analogy of the windshield wipers, which you obviously need when you're driving in the rain, but you're not actually focused on the windshield wipers when you're driving. But we get distracted all the time, which is part of the reason that these sessions don't last so long. They don't stick so well, typically. That's why we repeat ourselves a lot. So if you improve the quality of your focus, everything in your life will improve. Your ability to do anything, your ability to shift into any realization and to integrate that will be greatly enhanced if your focus is. And the beautiful thing is that there is a part of us which is always undistracted, which is ever present like a level that's parallel to our conscious minds, and it's always there. So really, undistracted is not about fixing your brain on a single concept. That's a cool skill, too. It's cool to be able to focus on one thing and one thing only and not get any other thoughts in the way. But there's a different type of non-distractedness, which is both deeper and easier to, to master or access. And that's actually to not identify with anything that appears. So rather than trying to fix the mind on a single concept and not have any other thoughts, which is more challenging to do for a lot of people. Instead, it's about noticing the distractions, noticing the thoughts, noticing the contents as they slide across the screen. And by simply noticing the stream of distractions, there's a deeper awareness that sets in. There's a feeling of motionlessness at the heart of that. There's a feeling of undistractedness because now you're actually deliberately witnessing the distractions which activates this deeper awareness which always is undistracted already and the more that you access that the more undistracted you become regardless or somewhat regardless of the activities of your mind and the contents of your thoughts and so you can be interacting with tons of distractions, but actually inwardly maintain an undistractedness if you practice this. And this will greatly increase the quality of your ability to decipher things, to deconstruct false concepts, to be sensitive to, to spiritual data also, like intuition, the subconscious messages and all that. You get to know yourself much quicker, much deeper and at subtler levels. If throughout the day you return, over and over again to noticing this undistracted awareness that's at the foundation of your 
conscious experience, without which you would not have the distractions even to begin with. It requires a, a source, it requires a root awareness. And that root awareness never changes, otherwise you wouldn't be able to notice change. That which you are by which you notice change has to be changeless, otherwise you would forget every change that happens. Right? So there is something changeless by which all the distractions are referenced, and that's why you have memory. That's why you notice change. It's because you don't change. The more you notice this, the more that becomes a quality in your conscious mind also. Quality of um, the ability to focus, the ability to listen, the ability to sense and perceive and be receptive. And feel free also. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the art of deconstructing from this space. Just staying really relaxed as this awareness which is already here. Even if you're not relaxed, it's already relaxed. You can be in total chaos. Your nervous system can be on fire. And yet that which knows it, that knowingness, is present. And it's a foundation which you can rest and rely on. You can notice if you want to. And again, every time you do, makes you more present. It makes you more truthful, makes you more courageous, more honest, more connected to that source field. Less egoic, less personal, more transpersonal. And from that space, or being at least to some degree aware of that, it becomes easier to see through the illusion of our concepts, to deconstruct to notice the myriad of conclusions that we arrive at every minute of every day, and just observe all those thoughts and judgments and references and projections. And if you stay really close to that awareness, that there is an awareness that doesn't change, which is accessed through being aware of the distractions, consciously aware of the fact that you're always distracted, that makes you undistracted. Or at least it wakes you up to that undistracted state. You can also begin to realize how this is kind of beyond deconstructing a concept, is actually seeing the unreality of it quite immediately by recognizing that all the things that we believe exist out there, and we do, we have a lot of beliefs. Based on our day to day interactions, we make so many assumptions of the world, the sun, the stars, the people, how we grew up, society, what's good for you, what's good, so many things, including spiritual topics. But true spirituality is not about being a spiritual person. It's not about having a new concept or place an old one. That's just growth. That's just evolution of the mind. But enlightenment, if you will, is much more about recognizing something that doesn't budge, that doesn't move that's not conceptual. It's not bound by any concept. And to be able to recognize that as yourself, as what is here, what you are, is very powerful. And that's at the heart of any enlightenment lineage or path. So the closer we get to that awareness, the more space that we allow for that, the more sensitive we become to our own concepts, which is very important if you want to accelerate your expansion, your evolution, but also your transcendence. It's important to become sensitive to what's animating you. Why am I speaking right now? Why am I moving my hand like this? Why am I having this thought? What's the basis of this thought? What is the base assumption that's producing all this thinking? To become sensitive to that, you need some manner of space or presence or um, a distance, if you will, the ability to witness your distractions, right? And as with anything, the more you practice, the deeper those waters become. So back to my point about sort of a transcendent step to deconstructing a concept, even though I haven't really explained that part yet, but 
let's start with the transcendent step, which is to really understand and see and witness and feel and be sensitive to how everything that we project or reference as being out there does not exist apart from the reference. It's projection. Like images on a screen. When you look at the movie, you're lost in the assumption that Tom Cruise is running across the uh, Harriet Carrier Top Gun. So it, well, any movie that we watch, we get distracted by it, and we get sucked into the vortex of the assumption that what we're witnessing has an independent nature. And Buddhists like to talk about this a lot, especially the more direct paths within Buddhism. One of their main messages is inseparability and a non-independent nature of things, meaning things, the things you think about as really there, really existent, in truth, do not have an independent existence, meaning they do not exist apart from consciousness. They do not have an independent source. To be able to access that experientially is one of their main messages or gateways into enlightenment or hallmarks of enlightenment is the realization that nothing has an independent nature. To the lived experience of that, not just the concept of it. Through recognizing the natural state that's ever present, that which is right now hearing my voice without you having to apply any effort. You can listen or not listen, but something recognizes that you're listening or not listening equally. You cannot hear a single word I'm saying consciously, and yet you can be aware of the fact that something is noticing that this is being spoken. There's a fundamental state at the root of every experience. And then the next step is to realize that those experiences do not appear outside of that natural state. You've never had an experience apart from consciousness or being. You've never had an experience. You don't know if there's a world out there. That's a complete assumption. And again, it drives some scientists crazy because they can't prove it. They can't prove that there really is a world. Because at the heart of it, all you know is experience, right? Perception is all we know. You can measure with a device that this and that happens out there, but that too is part of your experience. Good luck trying to prove that there exists something outside of perception. Now, if we assume that for a moment, if we assume the approach that there is only perception, what if there is only perception? What if really this is that magical of an illusion that truly perception equals reality? There is no reality that we perceive of, but the perception is the reality. There's no perception of a thing. There's only the referencing, the projecting of the thing. And then the assumption that the thing you project has an independent reality, independent from your projection or reference. That's sort of the transcendent step to deconstructing things. Because it deconstructs everything, like very quickly. It illuminates the fact that, or at least the experience that, things have an illusory foundation. And this is another way of describing the effects of what Anurag proposed when he said to not care about what happens. And one of the ways that this happened very profoundly for me, to really genuinely be able to not care about what happens, not care about the feeling state even, is to see its unreality. Because you can't care about something that you've realized is unreal. If your daughter asks you to play with Barbie dolls and your daughter believes the Barbie dolls are really alive and are really talking to each other, you can indulge the play. But past a certain age, you can never, no matter what she says, believe that that's true. You've seen through the illusion, the unreality of Barbie dolls actually being alive. So you can play that game. You can play with those concepts. You can play with the Barbie dolls. You can indulge the child. But no matter what you do, you can't really care about the game because you've seen through the illusion of its reality. Does that make sense? So this is transcending 
the giving of meaning or the giving of significance to things as if they have an independent nature, a nature independent from you, from consciousness, from the projector. And then you become aware of how massive this assumption is, how pervasive the assuming really is. All the time, we can't even talk about it, but we're already assuming a thousand things, even talking about deconstructing assumptions. And just to be aware of that and in awe of it and humbled by it and rest in the mystery of that is a great gateway into, well, greater enlightenment, really, like feeling more of that connection to source and that mystery and that faith-based living, if you will. And things become much more like space. It's also beyond this, the concept of space, but space is a concept that comes pretty close to describing the natural state. A lot of the qualities that you would attribute to space, you can also attribute to that which hears my voice right now. Which it is like space because it allows for everything to exist inside of it. All the experiences and projections are only known inside of that space. So it's a container of sorts, a formless container, like space. It's also pure, like space. Meaning that no matter what passes through, it does not get affected. You have actually never been affected. Even in your worst feeling state and the most afflictive states, that which knows the afflictive states, that which allows for the afflictive states to even be known, hasn't changed. That's why you can still remember the afflictive states. Again, if you would really change with the changing, you would not notice that things are changing. Because literally every nanosecond, you would forget the previous moment because you'd now be that different thing, which has no relationship to the previous thing. So the illusion of linearity and the experience of causality and the experience of change is all due to the foundation of this projection being changeless. It is in contrast to that that we can notice our, the evolution of our references and our concepts. And really all we know is concepts when it comes to our day-to-day -day experience and knowing ourselves, in most cases anyway. And enlightenment attempts to kind of pierce that and open you up to something that perhaps is non-conceptual, aka real. And another way to talk about the topic of enlightenment is reality versus delusion or projection or illusion. And so just at least begin to see through the myriad ways and at least to begin the humbling process of recognizing how full of assumptions we really are. But again, it's so powerful to see that a thing does not exist apart from referencing it. And the more you practice that, the more tangible that becomes. And then the more liberating it becomes. Anything that, like, we can learn all these things, but if it's not experiential, it's not liberating. If you want to be set free from a concept, then you have to really see through the concept completely then it leaves you. Then you can't believe in it, just like you can't believe that the Barbie doll is alive. Barbie doll still shows up. Your daughter still wants to play with the Barbie dolls. And you can indulge that. But you pass a certain threshold, after which it's impossible to be bothered by whatever happens to the Barbie dolls. But your life is just like that. But we give it the significance that it, it contains reality and that it exists apart from our projection. And there's all kinds of little exercises we could get into to get a more experiential sense of this. One methodology is um, imagine a triangle of perception. Let's just assume for a moment, just to keep it simpler, that all perception consists of an image, a feeling or sensation, and a word or concept. So image, feeling or sensation and word or label definition. And let's just assume that, just to make it simpler, you could maybe find other components, but let's just stick to these three. So take any example, any experience, for example, the experience of sitting on a chair right now and deconstruct it. So this is the less transcendent way, but it's the steps towards that. It can help. So maybe close your eyes. And notice how you have an image of yourself sitting in a chair quite automatically. It has color to it. It has shape to it. 
It's your image. It's your picture of your body sitting in a chair. You're picturing it, right? Can you see that? Now try to remove the picture. And what's left is the sensation. And perhaps the word or concept. The idea of sitting in a chair, but try to remove the image from your experience, from the equation of the triangle of perception. So just a feeling and perhaps the word sitting in a chair. Okay, so now let's look at the word sitting in a chair. Is any of those letters in that word the actual sitting in a chair that has an independent real nature? Can you say that any of the words, uh, my body is sitting in a chair, is any of those words or letters or shapes does any of that equal sitting in a chair? No, so it's not, the word is not the thing, right? It's a reference. Now, the image, picture yourself sitting in the chair you're sitting in. Is the image of sitting in a chair, does that equal the sitting in a chair? Or is it an image? All right, so remove the image, remove the words. What's left? Sensation. Is the sensation the reality of sitting in a chair? Or is it just sensation? If you remove the image and the words, if you put them together, it seems real. You're like, no, I'm a, this is actually the experience of sitting in a chair. But can you really say that the sensation all by itself equals the reality of sitting in a chair? What is your actual experience? It's just a sensation. So you must assume that you're sitting in a chair as a really independently existent reality. You must assume that before you can talk about it, think about it, reference your reality to it, and uh, decide that you want to get up out of the chair and all, all that stuff. It's quite useful for certain things. But, but if you take away these elements, break them apart, and you look at each element independently and ask yourself, is this experience of the image? Is that sitting in a chair or is it an image being perceived or experienced or projected? Is the word the sitting in the chair? Is the sensation the sitting in the chair? And if you find any other components of perception, feel free. You can deconstruct them to is this smell, perhaps? Is that sitting in a chair? No. But when you become unconscious of it, all these three components or multiple components combine the brain, if you will, combines them into an assumption. You can apply this to anything. Like this is a very, 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 very tiny glimpse of how far you can take this exercise. Now make sure you're mentally sane before you take this all the way, because you'll be living in space while you're talking to people and it gets weird. Right? So your dependence on form needs to soften over time before you're ready to fall into space and be okay. Because you have no identity in space in the way that you reference yourself. So take it slow, but begin to see that the things that you think ex actually exist are nothing but projections, thoughts, or just this creative hallucination, this physical hallucination where different components are combined. And if you're not looking directly at it, it seems real. The more directly you look at it, the more unreal it becomes. Become present to something and the thing disappears. Just you, your presence remains. If you're really direct with your experience, with your presence. Anything you become present to disappears. It's all a big myth. You're living a mythological continuum of perception. <laughs> So, but to just see even that, I mean, not even, it's a big, it's a big realization in a sense. It's a profound realization that truly you can't find a thing apart from thinking about it, apart from referencing it. You can't find it experientially. If you're honest, you can assume that it's there when you're not referencing it, but that's an assumption. That's not direct experience. And we could debate that all day long, but that's not the point. The point is to become really honest with direct experience just to start with. And if you're really honest with direct experience, you can, 
you can't find anything to really exist. It's all components projected, put together by some kind of an assumption or unconsciousness that strings these leaves together and makes for a little necklace that you can wear. But the necklace consists of all these empty, individuated hallucinations and assumptions. How wonderful. Then it becomes easy to not care about what happens when you see the unreality of it. And ideally know the state that remains in that clarity. Know yourself to still exist. Because if you believe that if reality is deconstructed, that you disappear, you know, you're just going to be in sort of a panic mode. But if you realize that you remain, there's something about you, something spiritual, something real that remains when the referencing stops or at least is seen through, even if it's going on, one can be non-distracted about the distraction. Again, don't try to force to stop your brain from thinking. It's a, it's a tough job. Like, you need practice to do that. It's possible. I can do it now, but that wasn't always as easy for me to just stop all thoughts. And you don't need to, to get this realization. And when you get this realization, you'll naturally be able to more and more stop the conceptual train at will. But that which is non-conceptual is already right now hearing my voice, and it's witnessing all the concepts. And it is kind of like space. In that it can't be defined by any form. It can't be defined by any reference or projection. And you want to tap into this experientially. You want to relax into this. And trust it. The more you trust it, the more blissful it becomes. The more expansive it becomes, the more real, for lack of a better word, it becomes. The more reliable, the more palpable, the more experiential. At first, the real is a concept and the unreal is real. But ultimately, the real becomes real and the unreal is seen as unreal. With an acceptance of it and its purpose and its relative relevance. But there's a shining through of an awareness of non-conceptual reality that begins to pervade the distractions. And so ultimately you can interact with the distractions without actually being distracted. And it's just like watching a movie. And at first that feels a little perhaps dry or mental, but the more you actually embrace that and like Surrender to it, not because we resist it. There's something in us that resists that. Even when we see it, there's a, mm, there's a resistance to it. Because it's the death of, of the false sense of self that's based on believing that all these components together form an independent reality to which you are then the subject that goes through these elements like an obstacle course called life. And that this is your reality. That this is the reality of your existence. That is the birth of the ego consciousness, if you will. The sense of self that is derived from perceptions. If you start to see through that, initially there is a resistance almost all the time. I mean, don't let me talk you into this, but this has been my observation, right? That there is some form of resistance. It doesn't have to be a struggle. It can just be sort of a mild resistance that doesn't allow you to fully enjoy it. it doesn't allow you to fully relax it. It's like when you're watching a movie that you're enjoying, but you're not actually fully relaxed. You're not fully surrendered to that or any experience, just a slight resistance to it. Because something in you knows that if I let that really get to me, then I lose control. I lose my reality. I lose my knowledge. I lose my understanding of cause and effect and where I'm at now, where I've been, where I'm going. And all the plants that I've made, what about the plants that I've made? How will I, you know, interact with my... Uh, the, my close ones and stuff like that. So we have those projections and these things don't actually change that much. So there's nothing really to worry about. Like they're still going to appear when you surrender to the space that allows for all projections and see through the projections as being projections. See that references don't reference things. Things are references. References are the things. 
the things exist only in the reference of the things. Just consider that as a possibility. It's a really cool shift. It becomes much more dreamlike, playful, free, and yes, a little intangible. Like you can't quite find yourself anywhere <laughs> as any particular thing. It becomes hard to, I mean, you got to kind of just act, you know, you're, especially when you're interacting with other minds that have fixed beliefs. You just, you indulge them because you understand, you know, there's no way to break this down right now and there's no need and there's no question for it and they're not ready for it. So all you can do is accept it and act it and have the most fun you can or joy or love doing that and allowing for that game to be played. But at any point, at no point do you have to take it seriously. At no point does it have to bog you down or tie you down to any kind of concept or relational experience. You're not actually in relationship with anything from this space in terms of a duality kind of thing. You have a certain quality of relating to these projections and these experiences that you can work on and proving the quality of it. Right? But technically, mechanically, you could say relationship between two objects is kind of a projection as well. And space doesn't really relate to anything else. It relates to itself in different forms, perhaps. But that's kind of the birth of a non-dual experience of self is to interact with yourself, to realize you're interacting with yourself. There's not really something outside of this space. Now, if you identify with the body, because this is what a lot of people do when they hear this non-dual knowledge, is they filter that through the identification of being a body. So then you get questions like, well, is only my reality real then? Are you a projection in my dream and you don't exist? That's the body speaking. You have to understand that the perception of the body can also be deconstructed. You're not the body. When I say you're interacting with yourself, I'm not saying your body is interacting with only its own thoughts and its own body. I'm saying space is interacting with itself as all things. Source is interacting, dancing with itself. The one infinite creator, if you will, God, Consciousness is interacting with itself, including the body of you and the body of another. Another fun thing to realize is that, or another method into this is uh, to get a sense for the inseparability of all this, the oneness, if you will, is to really realize that your body and someone else's body equally so is part of the image of the canvas. You identify with this body and you project other bodies or other bodies. But if you, look, if you again, go direct experience and you go take the image. Right now, I have the image of this, but part of the image is also that. That's part of the image. The wall is part of the image. That's part of the image. That's part of the image. Really, what I'm, if I don't assume things about space and time and distance and separation, there's just one image. There's one multidimensional imagery appearing. There's one image. Every snapshot is one image. I make the distinction. Now, if I go to my sensations, there's just sensations. I allocate them to the image I have of where in my body those sensations take place. But without the image of I'm feeling it in my left knee, the sensation isn't happening in my left knee. That is an assumption that needs words. It needs the image. Without the image in the word, there's just sensation. And it's part of one canvas. So who's to say that that part of the image is less me than this part of the image? Does it still make sense or is this getting a little psychedelic? Still good. So really there's all these assumptions of what we are. But when these assumptions are more and more seen through, it's more and more like you're interacting with yourself. Everything, everything is an interaction with yourself. Just instinctively, you realize this. Doesn't mean you still don't have the perception of, or the appearance of other bodies in this body, but you see through it while it's appearing. Any thoughts on this? Hmm? Brilliant. Brilliant? Brilliant. Nice. Spoken like Morpheus. 
<laughs> so this space filled with potential creative energy and nothing ever affects the space otherwise the space would not remember anything right if you are the thing you witness then if the thing you witness changes you wouldn't know about the change again try to get that there must be something that witnesses all changes if you were form and the form changed, you would not have any memory of the previous form. You would be that snapshot in that moment. So it's a continuous movie reel, like a continuous film. And you don't have to be distracted by the stream of the film all the time. You can take moments, pause. Take a moment to really go very deep into the understanding that you're assuming all of it to have an independent reality it's a big assumption you don't even have to believe one way or the other just to become direct and honest with your experience and at least acknowledge that you're assuming it you don't have to come to any conclusion then about oneness either it's just about staying in that total openness that total not knowing anything for sure, but, and get comfortable with that. Make that your home. Because it already is, so you might as well get comfy. Because <laughs> that's where you spend the rest of eternity. Right? You just fill it up with stuff, and then you give it the reference of having an independent reality. You give it that assumption. And then you get attached to that, and then when something gets stolen from you, or someone dies, or like we get super sad, or this or that, those are the attachments. Buddha spoke of. But if you see through the illusion, then your attachments will dissolve. Rather than trying, it's really impossible to let go of something you're attached to if you believe it's real. You can, fake, you can only fake it at best. You can paste spiritual concepts over it. And people do this all the time. Nothing wrong with it, it's just not really truly free. It's the same state of identity. But now there's a concept of oh, everything is perfect, or this or that, or it's not really real anyway. But to really see through the illusion is what's re really needed to truly free yourself of the attachment to the point where it doesn't even appear. Even when the same situation appears, the attachment doesn't come along with it more and more, right? And this takes practice, but with practice, you regain your liberation just by deconstructing all the illusions you've built up all your life and who knows for how many lifetimes that's stuck in your field of consciousness potentially so the deconstruction process potentially is a a process that uh deconstructs more than just what you've built in this life it's a deep cleansing of unreality of assumption of illusion the coming back into reality. What's reality? That word is actually very powerful. It's been misused because we attribute reality to so many things and then we change our minds and then it's no longer real. And this is, so obviously none of that is reality. That's why it's a powerful word because if you really tune into the message of the word reality, what does reality mean? What, what constitutes reality? What are the requirements for something to be real? <laughs> right? What are the requirements for reality? Mine would be, it must always be. If it's one day it is and one day it's not, it can't be reality. So permanence is a requirement for reality. In my book, anyway. Feel free to come up with your own. Changelessness does not mean change is not part of the experience. But reality, if there is such a thing, it must be changeless. This is kind of a different way of saying permanent. If something is permanent, it must be changeless. It doesn't mean it can't allow for all this beauty and bullshit. But there is a quality, if you will, of changelessness that constitutes reality. So if it appears, 
think about it, if it appears, it must be unreal, at least from this way of seeing it. If something appears, meaning it comes into your experience anew, it must be unreal. It doesn't make it right or wrong or bad. It doesn't invalidate that it's experienced. It just means it doesn't qualify as reality. That's all it means. And now think about what percentage of your experience has at some point appeared. That's kind of creepy. Because everything you relate to has appeared at some point. Everything you relate to as reality has appeared. What if all that does not qualify as real, as reality? Because at some point it appeared. So how can it be real? It can't be really real if it appears. I'm not saying it's not appearing. It's different. I'm not saying it's not experienced. I'm not saying it's not perceived. I'm not saying it doesn't therefore exist in that way. I'm just saying it's not real. You get the difference? Because again, the mind is black and white and quite rudimentary. So if you haven't had a lot of subtle practice, then you're going to take these concepts and turn them into new concepts. So when I say something is unreal, it doesn't invalidate it at all. I'm just saying it's not real. I'm not saying it doesn't exist or doesn't appear. I'm just saying it's not real. Which changes your relationship to the appearance or experience or perception. When I say appearance, I just mean anything that's experienceable. Any perception that you can have appears. So appearances or perception equals appearance because it appears. But if it appears, it's not permanent. It's not changeless, so it cannot be reality. Or at least it cannot contain it. Maybe potentially it's made of reality in some way, shape, or form, right? But it does that thing, that thing, that appearance does not contain or define reality. Just allow the deconstruction to take place because you're just looking for a new concept, a new answer. But that's not what it's about. It's about the experience of emptiness or freedom or seeing through the assumption of reality given to things as if they exist outside of referencing them, which we don't know. We can't prove that. We can never prove that because whatever we're proving, we're referencing. <laughs> no matter how many devices we built to measure it, it's still referenced. How do you know something exists apart from referencing it? All you know for sure is that things appear as your reference. And I think Einstein, as he studied some quantum physics said something like, does the moon even exist when no one's looking at it? And there's some interesting tests that are being done that suggest that is the case, right? The observer changing the manifestation and all that. Those are some hints in this direction. But it's not about proving it. It's, it's just about getting as uh, direct as we can, as honest as we can with what we're actually experiencing so that we can deconstruct all the assumptions that we filter our everyday energy through in our relationships and communications. We waste so much energy talking and thinking and acting based on assumptions. And we're just uh, stressing out our nervous system for no good reason. When we could be completely relaxed and centered within ourselves, no matter the circumstances or thoughts or appearances. And the more you see the unreality of what's appearing, the easier it is to not care about it. It's really hard to not care about something you really believe exists, independent from this ever unfolding stream of consciousness. It's, it's challenging. I would almost say it's impossible. I mean, it's not because you can shift your, what you care about over time, but in that moment, if you care about something and you're trying to let go of that branch, there's just this mechanism, like you can't let go of that branch until you're holding on to a new concept, to a new branch. It's like the instinct of the monkey, just won't let go until it reaches the new branch. We're like that, our minds are like that. So you can replace one concept with another concept, potentially a more expansive concept, one that's closer to the truth, one that your soul can thrive in more and you feel more alignment in that concept. And that's a great, that's a gradual path in that way. And that's why we have these insights. And that's why we use these concepts. It's like, Okay, I'm suffering right now about this thing. I'm attached to it. 
So let me bring in a more expensive concept about how this is all imperfect timing and I have a higher self that does this and that. And therefore, ah, okay, I can see it from that concept now. Because I changed the concept, my experiential sensational reality also changes and I feel better. So that's good. I recommend that to a degree, but it's not the same as what we're talking about right now. It's just a little more radical and it's a little bit less uh, man-based. Like it's a little less relatable to the human mind. It's more abstract and more subtle. Again, to return to the understanding that all this is a projection, potentially. And see how it feels different, how it changes your state of being. It causes a profound shift in perception and feeling and sensing and being and knowing yourself. And in, in some of the Seth books, uh, the entity Seth describes how everything in life that we know at our level or our dimension, if you will, is basically consciousness in a symbolized form. Like we're relating to ourselves through symbols. This is all one giant symbolization of self. And the higher in consciousness or deeper in consciousness we go, the more the symbolizations become subtler and subtler until and they're describing states of consciousness where there is no symbolization. Instead, it's direct cognizance of self. It's direct. It's like no longer looking at a mirror or knowing yourself indirectly. It's knowing yourself directly without symbolization. Knowing the self, knowing that which is, knowing I am, without symbolization being needed. And he describes that as, or they, you know, he describes that as being rare on this planet, but it's possible. So everything is a symbolization or a permission slip for knowing yourself, exploring yourself, expressing yourself, learning about yourself, growing, etc. Everything is a symbolization or a permission slip. The more you know yourself directly, the less dependence there is on symbolization. That's why some people are really set on, let's say, your horoscopes. Like, that is an obvious example of the subtler mechanism I'm talking about here, is people that carry their spiritual practice on their sleeve, like, like it's a one-man show kind of thing, where they only know themselves through astrology, or they filter everything through a particular methodology, or through the Enneagram, or through incense, or <laughs> So it's a very indirect spiritual awakening or it's indirect knowledge of self. It's through a lot of symbolism, right? And then so people that kind of transcend that and, and discover more direct approaches, they kind of stop resonating with that. They kind of feel like, you oh, know, that's good for you. And that's great. But it's like the Barbie doll thing. Cool. It's cute. You can listen to it, but it can't, it can't convince you. Like it's, it's not what you are. And you don't need that permission slip to know yourself or grow or make a decision. Nothing wrong with them, by all means, use permission slips. I'm not invalidating them. I'm just saying as you grow more and more direct in your experience, more and more confident in yourself, through these permission slips, through these symbolizations, right? We got to give them credit because I got to where I am at through all these permission slips and symbols. So by all means, use them. Use them, teachers or symbols, permission slips, these trainings. And the purpose of that is to make themselves uh, redundant. To have you gain direct knowledge of self, direct connection to source. The calling work is a good example of a permission slip to get into that direct perception of self, that direct sense of source as you, you as source. To be constituted as that. And when you are in that state, you can even glimpse it before you're there permanently. You can glimpse it. When you glimpse it, you're like, ah, I'm so aware of it right now that I, I'm starting to see through my dependence on all these symbolizations, these permission slips, these tools. I see the irrelevance of the teaching that got me here. Beautiful, right? 
especially if it's done with validation, with like appreciation of the thing that got you there while seeing that it's not real, but you're, you're appreciative of it. There's a gratitude, there's a humility about that to appreciate the illusion for what it does for you, which is like a mirror. This whole game is here to wake you up to yourself. And there's so many different tools that we can apply to do that. But it's, I mean, tools aside, it's really as simple as just wanting to become really honest with what am I actually directly experiencing and knowing? What can I actually directly know without assumption? And at first you can't even know what that is because you're so used to symbolization that you will come up with some form of symbolization. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an art that gets subtler and subtler and more and more profound, deeper and deeper back into the self, and less and less things and objects and subject-object relationship starts to soften and soften and soften, and there's more and more direct knowledge of self, direct perception of being. So if you ask yourself, what am I actually directly experiencing? Like your world becomes so much simpler because there's not a lot that remains if you're really honest with it. You could even argue nothing remains. And then a realization occurs in the absence of all things. A realization of what you are. Because now the veil is gone. The veil of assumptions. Then what is left? Can you intuit that? Can you grok that? Can you allow for that? And you need some manner of attention spent, some focus, some sort of dedicated, true desire to have that type of realization, because otherwise you just get too distracted by symbols along the way. And the path to enlightenment is subtler and subtler and subtler symbols, which is symbolized in the analogy of Buddha sitting by the tree, deciding finally, after all the seeking and fasting and this and that, that I won't get up from underneath this tree until I achieve my goal. And then he was bombarded with temptation after temptation, subtler and subtler, but he ignored all of it. He ignored all the levels, the stages of symbolization in one week, and then attained his realization in that no thingness, realization of self, and it required great attention spent, great intention, great desire to cut through the mist of distraction. And again, just to be aware of your distractions already frees you from them. Just to notice that you have them. That's why acknowledgement is so important. That's why we started with that yesterday and today. It's like the acknowledgement of your flaws and your distortions and to become really honest. And on the outside, nothing much changes. That's the funny part of it. And you'll build over time, you'll build a whole new way of relating to things and people and yourself in the illusion of interacting. But it's a, it's a big game. <laughs> and at first the human mind interprets it as loneliness. Then it kind of becomes aloneness, which is pure. And then it's all oneness. If you take the word aloneness, all oneness. Kind of a nice bridge. First, it feels lonely because we, we separate, we filter this. When we start having these realizations, it's like we filter no thingness as meaning lonely because we're used, so used to relating to symbols and other people. And then over time with marination and purification, that becomes aloneness, which is more like a sort of a peaceful home base in the world that you have almost like a private space of aloneness that you can access. And it feels much more friendly than loneliness. It's more neutral, it's aloneness. And then as you deepen into that and you see that actually there is no outer world from which you need to retreat. There is all oneness. And that's when the joy of realization begins to increase. That's when the thing that used to scare you, the death of the ego, becomes your greatest joy and bliss and freedom and liberation. That's when the thing you resist becomes liberating. Because you surrender to the truth of no thingness. 
And what do you find there if you stay there? And that subtle awareness is profound. It's an awakening from the world. And then you can even go beyond beingness. You can even deconstruct beingness and consciousness. Not mentally, not conceptually. You can only do that from the space of beingness. And then it's like the entire creation disappears. And what remains cannot be described. And it's not even an experience. It's reality. It's infinity, you could say. It's ingraspable. It's not a concept. It's not even space. It's the one source of all beingness, creation, existence, form, manifestation. So we deconstruct our way back to source through this symbolized world, which acts like a mirror for the one to know itself. And the beauty, again, is that it's totally up to you. It's so up to you to make use of this or not. And you always have access to this. If just that desire is pure, in every moment, no matter what's happening in your life, you can always rely on this choice. You can always rely on this choice of purification. It's your best friend. You won't get there immediately. What I just described, you won't get there immediately. You just, maybe you're a very rare case, but don't expect to get there immediately. Just love the work of purification. Becoming more direct. Less assumptions. Becoming more comfortable with not assuming things. Not needing an identity through assumptions and conclusions. And becoming more direct in your perception. That's the process of enlightenment. It's just enlightening yourself through this directness, this direct work. And it's so beautiful. It's your best friend. This sadhana, or the spiritual practice, is actually your best friend. Because it's the most reliable. It's always up to you. It's always available. It's always calling you forth. It's why this world is here. It's to inspire it in you. So everything is because of that, at least in my book, in my philosophy. Everything exists. Everything appears for the sake of inspiring this relationship to yourself. This retracing of your steps, of your assumptions. And it's liberating more and more liberating. And if you just relax, it will begin to dawn. You just, just relax. Just chill. You know that you have the knowledge. Just allow that quality of the direct experience of it to dawn through resting that identity. Just relax. Just let it go. Or don't even let it go. Even that sounds like, you know, oh, I'll just let it go. Just relax about it. Even if you're completely attached, relax about the attachment. If you're completely tense, just chill out about it. Completely chill out about it. Surrender to the tension. Totally accept the tension. Just be confident that this will dawn. All that's needed is the desire, and it's true for anything, any manifestation or realization. You have whatever you want. If you want it, you have it. And we're all that infinity. The senses can't grab a hold of it. It's not to be found with the senses. It's before the senses appear to you. So you got to go back to before, prior to. It's a very powerful practice to go prior to whatever is appearing right now. Prior to the senses. Prior to the thoughts. Seek there. There's something prior to all this appearance, to all sensation. You can't find it inside of the world of, sen of the senses. You just can't find it. Just knowing that will take you beyond it. Just knowing where not to look already redirects the seeking. It's like, ah, 
oh, wait a second, all my energy is like to try to find it in a particular sensation or thought or word. It's not in my mind and it's not in my senses. Where does that leave you? Be curious about that. Saves all this energy, just realizing that you're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> Suddenly all this energy goes whoop, back into your cell. That's when meditation starts naturally. By realizing that you've been dispersing your energy, and seeking for something in a place where you will not find it. That's calming to realize. It's like, oh, well, that eliminates 99% of what I was looking inside of. I'm happy to know that my camera is not in this closet on the attic of my mom's house. It saves me searching the attic. What a relief. I can now focus more precisely. It's not in the senses. You are not to be found in the senses, in the world produced by the senses and the concepts that the mind gives to the senses. So then where is it? What remains? Without the senses and without the concepts and the labels of the thoughts, And the seeking ends and the discovery begins right there. That space before the mind and the senses right there. The seeking is redirected into finding. 